once again, we're here at Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers, Authors and Artists and Showcase here at Bremerton Kitsap Access Studios. And this is Mark Miller again. And today I have an author, Tom Mengert. He's been here before, and uh, but he has his series now that he's just it's, is uh, finishing up now an extremely, I would say, I don't know if complicated is the word for it, but a, a, a very uh, exhaustive examination of the Sherlock Holmes. So we're going to be talking about that and his, I guess you might call it his journey with the Sherlockian world. How you doing today, Thomas? Good to be back, Mark. Yes. Um, been, how many years ago was three, four, four years ago, something like that? Yeah, we we've yeah. done several now. Yeah. And uh, so I've written other things besides the Sherlock series. Uh, the conf it's collectively called the Confessions of Sherlock Holmes. Okay. And there's some thoughts behind that right off the bat, which is the Confessions of Saint Augustine, is one of the first autobiographies ever yeah. and the most theologically oriented. And the subtitle of this was a, a theological exploration of the home stories. And there's a reason for that. When I, <clears throat> when I began this entire process, I wanted to write two books before I pass on into the next world. Yeah. And one of them, <clears throat> one of them was designed to be a philosophy book that would literally incorporate everything that I knew about life and death, and everything, yeah. literally everything, and everything yeah. book, which everyone would like to write someday. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to write a definitive Sherlock Holmes book that would answer all of the unanswered questions that still remain from the original stories. Now, there's a, a branch of what is called Sherlockian scholarship that grew up around the Baker Street Irregulars organization in New York City and also the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. And each had a separate publication and that of the Baker Street Irregulars was where uh, aficionados would say, they started with a premise, Sherlock Holmes was a real person mm -hmm. and then did research in the real world to connect up things in these stories that w and, and actually find the places yeah. or prove that the events really happen. And so I'd studied those for years and when I was a, a college student, uh, there was a professor at the University of Washington that was also a big Sherlock Holmes fan. And the two of us got together and formed a local branch. Th those were called Skyan Societies mm. uh, of the original Baker Street Irregulars, and ours uh, was called the Victorian Gentlemen. And it existed for a while, and I had my own publication, and it was subscribed to from two universities and also around the country. Uh, then when Ron DeWall formed the World Bibliography of Sherlock Holmes, both my publication and myself were mentioned in it. So my Sherlockian credentials go back a long yeah. way. And what drew you originally, years and years and years ago, what kind of drew you originally to Sherlock Holmes? Well, uh, when I was a kid, and still am yeah, in many ways, as we all are, huh? Yeah. Um, I found two things got me into Sherlock Holmes. I started with the Basil Rathbone movies. Mm. And after that, there were 14 of those. And after that, I became fascinated with just the character. And uh, my grandmother purchased for me the complete Sherlock Holmes, which had literally everything that Conan Doyle had ever written right. on Sherlock Holmes in his entire life. Uh, paradox is that if you can include all the volumes of the, my Sherlock series, right. it's longer than everything Sherlock Holmes was written by right. Conan Doyle. So how many, so I know you split it up into volumes, mm -hmm. but it's one continual story. It's one continual and how story. Many, and how many words is that? That, uh, it started out at, at uh, in the very first, when it first was published in 2014, it started out as about 830,000 words. Okay. The longest book usually quoted in the English language of con one continuous yeah. narrative again 
uh, also appeared in seven volumes was a book called Clarissa, written in the 18th century by Samuel Richardson, a great mm -hmm. classic. And so with the eighth volume sequel, at this point, I'm over a million words, right. which means this is the longest book ever written in the English language. Because it's, even though it's split up in volumes, it's one continual story. That's the key thing. It would have to be. So story. technically, it's not a series. It's a single right. work, but it's broken in, in pieces. And so each volume takes off where the other ones leave right. off. And this... We were having a discussion the other day about this. Your work, which is a literary work, and, and, and this is something that a lot of us, we don't, a lot of us other authors, we write more, I call them adult pulp fiction, stuff like mm -hmm. that. You write more in the original literary sense of writing that Conan Doyle actually did. Yes. And in the process of doing that, you took up and you filled in a time frame that there's a gap in the life of Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to kind of explain a little bit of that, how you got involved with that. The, the key thing with that is that not only <laughs> Watson always appears as the narrator in most of the Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. stories. There are a few in Holmes' own words. But because of the way it's arranged, Watson uh, sometimes leaves tantalizing clues to unwritten stories uh, just to kind of uh, pique the reader's interest. So in the seventh volume, I actually was able to bring some of those mm -hmm. in and it finally give their nature. And other writers have done that also. But the key thing, the, this, is, this is the main thing, is that there are several things in the Sherlock Holmes stories that under Watson's narrative do not make sense, could never have happened the way. And the first of these is the supposed death of Professor Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls. Which this is, could like never said, happen. This cover of this book, that's a, in, when he opens up his uh, jacket or coat there, that's the actual falls, correct? The cover is a superimposition of the actual falls onto the figure of Holmes sort of giving across the idea that Holmes is remembering back to this most signal event right. in his life. Now, I'll give you a little backstory on that, which will be fascinating yeah. for, for your audience, which is that Conan Doyle did not like Sherlock Holmes. Right. And this, a lot of people would find this disillusioning, except that there was a reason for this. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle wanted to write, he had his own ideal author, and it was Sir Walter Scott. Mm. And he wanted to write great historical fiction like Ivanhoe and the Waverly mm. novels. Okay. And here was this uh, detective who suddenly was taking over his life. The problem was that they were also paying him lots of money to write Sherlock Holmes stories because they were a big hit. Yeah. They were the best British hit since the until the Beatles showed up, there yeah. was nothing better than Sherlock Holmes from England. And, and, and then, of course, Doctor Who. <laughs> exactly. And so here's the situation. Uh, the mystery genre, which I know we're all into genre literature, yeah. fantasy is big, sci-fi is big, you write a lot of that. And mystery stories go back to the mystery plays in England, which were theological in nature. They were designed to ask the very hard questions and to bring specifically Christianity before an audience, much as the ancient bards did with their poetry. So by writing a book like this with a theological slant, yeah. uh, I'm actually very true to the original concept of what a mystery story even is. Uh, but a lot of people might say, well, when you say theology, are you talking strict Christianity? Are you talking about... Am I going to get a, a lesson in catechetics? And the answer to that is no. Uh, this is a book that examines the concept of every religion all over the world and her Sherlock Holmes desperately seeking for a meaning to life and Professor Moriarty simultaneously preparing for a battle of wits between the two of them about every significant question that has appeared through all of literature. So this is 
I designed it to be the Shakespeare of Sherlock Holmes oh, okay. stories. And you mentioned, of course, what actually everybody thinks of, at least in our um, age group, and that was the old Bathel Athlone movies. Mm -hmm. The problem with Hollywood is they made Watson seem like this comedic figure. Mm -hmm. And in the real book, Watson was actually kind of like a rock for Sherlock. Absolutely. Very, very good point because the in, in order to fill out the character of Sherlock Holmes to the depth that I wanted to do, I also had to explain Moriarty in, in, in intimate detail far mm -hmm. more than had ever been explored and Watson also at the same time. And then I noticed certain strange similarities. They, uh, a, a true Sherlockian say where those were hidden clues within the mind of, mm. of Conan Doyle himself. But in point of fact, they just happen to be there. Certain things simply fit together. So after, I would like to think that the reader after reading my version of Sherlock Holmes would say, not only did you connect all the dots, but I find your Sherlock Holmes not more believable because that would imply that the other was not believable, yeah. but you would see it'd be like taking a flat surface and suddenly being moved into three dimensions. All of a sudden you're seeing depths in Sherlock Holmes that nobody, including Conan Doyle, he yeah. wanted to write adventure tales. He even wrote some science fiction. Yeah. And so, but, but interspersed, and this is what makes the Holmes figure so fascinating, are various hints of a deep probing theological interest in Conan Doyle himself. And I start the book with some quotes from the original stories to show that I'm not off base in my overall concept. Right. Now, what is the wager at Reichenbach Falls? This is a key point. The wager is that Moriarty and Holmes, I don't want to preempt the story by telling you every detail, right. but what, what they do is they, they do meet at the Reichenbach Falls. Moriarty's criminal organization has now been arrested and, and will be brought to trial. And only Moriarty and maybe another friend of his are still on the, on, on, and they're traveling across Europe. And so Holmes and Watson go to a little Swiss village called Meiringen, where the Reichenbach Falls are just outside of there. And they, uh, Holmes supposedly has no idea that Moriarty is following him and was seeking revenge. So they finally have this great meeting, and it turns out that each of them realizes that each is an artist in their own way, and to lose the other is to lose the one human being on the earth that might be able to understand what the other has mm -hmm. been seeking all their lives. So here, each, if, you, if, you, if each killed the other, it would destroy the whole purpose of the artistic quest that each of them had been on. And that quest was the nature of life itself. The greatest mystery that everybody asks so, themselves. So their, their existence was intertwined. Yes. And if they didn't have this other foil, then their existence would be rendered greatly meaningless. reduced mm -hmm. into just like every, everybody else, I guess everybody else. They wanted to be something different. Exactly. And that they needed that other person to be able to do that. So each comes to the simultaneous realization that neither one of them can die this day. Right. But then it turns out that something else shows up. Moriarty realizes that crime was not what he enjoyed doing. Mm. Crime was a good way to make money. It was not what he wanted to end up. He wanted to do pure physics research and be the Einstein of his day. Mm. Meanwhile, Sherlock Holmes, who is, if you look at the original tales, is always solving problems for governesses and the little obscure cases, none of which really earned very much money. And the question right. in the reader's mind is, how did Holmes survive if he never collected any fees? Well, I answer that question in this book. It turns <laughs> out Holmes has a brother up in the Holmes estate in Yorkshire, yeah. a third brother that, ha although it had been brooded about as a possibility, does not appear in the original stories, but Mycroft does. And I also fill in Mycroft with a depth that has never been explored before. Mycroft oh. is the second brother. Right. So I have three brothers of Holmes, and that is, emerges as the story goes on. And 
something, I guess, the, the term, the name Moriarty has now gone into the lexicon of, of everyday life about what a Moriarty is. Yeah. So when you start looking back at what author Conan Doyle did, you know, part of our culture now is based on the concepts that he created around Sherlock Holmes, Moriarty, and everybody else. Yeah. Moriarty is the bad guy, Holmes is the good guy. Mm-hmm. Now here's where it gets interesting, and this is where the wager concept comes in. Once they realize that neither one of them can die at the Reichenbach Falls, yeah. they have to come up with another solution. And the solution is each of them wants a different life. Holmes has been confined to London for most of his days. Mm-hmm. He wants to see the world. And he also wants to ask the questions that have never been solved in all the cases that he's pursued, which is the nature of existence itself. Moriarty wants to do the same thing, and he wants to start with science. He figures physics will answer those questions. But also, Moriarty has a grudge against the British Empire, which will be explored in later volumes. Mm -hmm. And his desire is to to bring down the entire British Empire and to finally prove that, that he can create something, that uh, a problem that Holmes cannot solve. So Holmes, meanwhile, is looking for the meaning of life in a different direction. So they agree to have a wager. Holmes is, be, is free. Now, this is a thing called the Great Hiatus. Right. And I have to bring this in now because it's, it, it's his key. Sherlock Holmes disappeared from the public view between 1891 and 1894. And it's called the Great Hiatus by Sherlockian scholars. That's where it's the big gap. Right. And in the Adventure of the Empty House, which appears in a book called The Return of Sherlock Holmes, Holmes explains that he traveled during those years and he gives Watson a whole bunch of destinations but never explains why he ever took them. Big gap. Yeah. needed to be filled by somebody and I decided to do it in such a way and in such completeness that nobody would ever be able to match this. This is my, the Moriarty yeah. side of me <laughs> to write the ultimate Sherlock Holmes book. So what I did is I said, there's a reason. Holmes is traveling, seeking the meaning of life by, by exploring various theologies and going to, to various places. Mm-hmm. And he's also carrying out a simultaneous mission assigned him by Mycroft to go to the Sudan to explore uh, the key geopolitical role that the Sudan plays in safeguarding the route to India, which is the basis of the, India, of the British Empire. Yeah. Uh, to lose India... Essentially, the way the statesmen of the time thought, if we lose Sudan, we lose Egypt. If we lose Egypt, we lose the Suez Canal, and we lose access to India, and, and right. we, we have to protect the land route to India, and we have to... Pre- now, here's the paradox. There's, yeah. there's always been a prophetic element to the Sherlock Holmes stories. Look at the con- conditions in the world today in the Sudan. Right. Civil War, look at the situation right now. It is almost as though Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty are enacting what is going on in the world itself today. I didn't plan on writing a prophetic book, but it's turning out to be so. The the thing is about the whole British Empire, people don't even realize, of course, you had the the British East India Mm -hmm. uh, Company. company that basically ran India supposedly is an independent country, but they're actually running it for commercial crown. purposes, yeah. yeah. And that way they could, the British government had some deniability, mm-hmm. but the British were behind the East Indian uh, company forcing opium on China. Yes, yes, because tea, with this balance of trade issue is not something that we're only dealing with today. Right. We could do a whole separate show on this, oh, of course, exactly. but, but it's intriguing to me that uh, there's a, a term called the great game, that whichever country controls Central Asia controls the world. Yeah. And we're watching this going on right at this moment. And the reason is, is because it's the largest land mass on the planet, and the center, whoever controls the center, controls the trade routes. Right. So the Belt and Road Initiative that the Chinese are currently doing, this is, this is part of that. Well, I worked all these theoretical aspects of monetary theory. 
I, I, everything is in there, and there's even a Jungian element to the extent that Holmes and Moriarty in some ways are two sides of the same coin. So their famous wager goes this way. Holmes gets to travel all over the world and find the meaning of life. Moriarty gets to retire and become a professor and pursue his research, and they mm -hmm. agree to meet after Holmes returns in 1894, but that their final, their final battle does not take place it, until 1897. So there's two narratives going on at the same time. One is Sherlock Holmes' journal kept during his mm -hmm. travels. The other is a contemporaneous story after the wager works its way out, the, literally the last act of the battle between Holmes and, and Moriarty. And they battle it out in 1897 and 1898, and Holmes, according to the original stories, retires in 1903. The reason the eighth volume sequel is called somewhat a sequel, even though it itself is, a con is part of the continuous yeah. narrative, is because it, 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 ha it, it deals with everything that happened to Sherlock Holmes after 1903. And everything that's in the original Confessions of Sherlock Holmes, the seven volumes, right. that deals with the idea of everything that happened before that in okay. 1897 and 1898. So you've actually attempted to, I guess you'd put a little period and explanation mark on his life. Mm -hmm. to a certain extent at the very end. Well, it, I had to do it because yeah. I said, I've already explained everything else in Sherlock right. Holmes. If I don't take him, if I don't get closure on this thing, yeah. and I also have to explain how the Confessions of Sherlock Holmes was written by Watson. He is actually writing it in 1917. Right. And I have to explain why I have to explain so many things to, to really get the rounded out. That's why the eighth volume really is essential. Right. And uh, the other thing is the, 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 the wager, the final intellectual battle actually has, starts in, in volume five. And, but to understand what they're going to be talking about, you have to have read the preceding volumes. It's, it, in other words, it is meant to be read sequentially. Right. You don't skip around with the volumes. Yeah. But anybody knows that anyone that wants to cheat in a mystery story can read the end and know who, who yeah, who's exactly. the murderer is, yeah, right? Right. So I start with that, and, and volume one already lets you know that Sherlock Holmes wins the battle. That's not what the book's about. The book is about how he won the battle. Yeah. So Sherlock Holmes wins, but how makes is the essence of right. everything. And there's where the theology comes in, because the problem isn't, isn't asking ourselves uh, uh, which religion are we. It's really the question to begin with of shall we have any religion at all? And this is the, the battle between Moriarty's starting point is to say the world is up to us. There's no God, there's no a priori meaning to existence, mm -hmm. therefore it's a very Nietzschean concept right. that whoever makes the world the way they want it wins the game. Okay. Very cynical, yeah. very dark view of, of life. Well, well we're going to have to... I have to show the p parallel. Yeah. Well, Sherlock Holmes, in contrast, is groping desperately for a Christian explanation of the world and to say there is a moral purpose to yeah. the universe and everything does matter. And then he has to prove that in terms that Moriarty will accept because Moriarty, as part of the wager says, and this is the key thing, yeah. if you can convince me, Sherlock Holmes, that there is a meaning to life and death, I will help you destroy my plot at the very moment of its, of its execution. I promise I will not start the machinery till you return. Right. But after that, if you can prove that you win to my, t to my satisfaction, I will help you destroy my plot and I will be your ally thereafter. There's the mystery yeah. of the Sherlock Holmes confessions that I wrote. Okay. And just before we end this, one last thing, because we kind of touched on it. Arthur Conan Doyle actually wrote the original The Lost World book. And so anything else that Hollywood's done, he wrote the professional Professor Challenger series. Of which, of which this was The Lost one. World, yeah. yeah. But he's most well known because of Sherlock Holmes. 
Yes, but he himself wrote a book called The White Company. It was a historical novel. Right. And this is where I got the great insight into precisely, you know, why Conan Doyle was the way he was. Right. Now, later in life, he became a religiously obsessed with spiritualism. Yeah. And he was also very deeply involved in the Boer War and, in the, and wrote a history of the Boer mm -hmm. War, which was a, a, a lot of people neglect that war. It was the largest war, most mechanized war to take place prior to the First right. World War. And the other thing that's important is that besides the Boer War, another key thing was the Battle of Omdurman, which settled the question of Sudan once right. and for all. And that appears in the book. So in other words, this book is not only rooted in Sherlock Holmes, it's rooted in, in history, in it's history. rooted in geopolitics. Yeah. And so I, I caution my readers, don't approach this book as anything other than a life-changing experience. Okay. Don't approach it as mere entertainment. If you're ready, though, for a real intellectual challenge and you really want to know the lowdown on Sherlock Holmes to a degree that you cannot imagine, then I think you'll have great fun with this book. Okay, and with that, we're going to have to enter the interview because we're starting to run short on time. But once again, I'm glad that that uh, Thomas could come back to the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television. And hopefully in the audience is enjoying this as part of the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers Showcase and, and um, Artists and Interview Series that we do. Once again, of course, I have to thank the Bremerton Kitsap, Kitsap Access Television staff. Without them, this show would not be uh, put on. Uh, as often as we are able to do it. Uh, if you're interested in more interviews such as this, we are broadcast on Wave Cable Astound Channel 3, Comcast Channel 12, on Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. In addition, we also then, we broadcast these shows through a uh, YouTube channel that we have through my publisher, Blue Forge uh, Press and Blue Forge Films. We, Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers, exist strictly to help the, all of the artisans, authors, creatives out there to try to get their products, their creations, out into the public. We meet twice a month on the month, first and third Wednesdays at the Spiro's Pizza on Kitsap Way in Bremerton, Washington. Meetings usually start about 7 p.m. I'm usually there earlier. If you're interested in any type of crea uh, creativity, uh, even though we do have tendency to specialize writing and publishing and marketing, please stop by. I'd say at the very least you're going to have a nice little intellectual conversation, including about subjects like Sherlock Holmes. So. With that, I hope the viewing public enjoyed this interview we had with Thomas here. And hopefully some of you out there that are really interested in Sherlock Holmes will go take a look at his book series. Mark Miller here at Kitsap Literary Arts and Writers. Wish you to have a very interesting and productive day and also a very productive and nice year in 2024. Good day.